Namaste. So, Shankaracharya's commentary on the Brahma Sutra is, I mean, in my experience anyway, the most advanced, most exalted knowledge available on this planet. And I've been searching for a long time, ever since my studies of physics and metaphysics back in high school. And of course, through the whole hippie thing and everything, I was a staunch meditator. I started out with Zen, and then I went through so many other disciplines. And now we have like a top-down view, a comprehensive view, the esoteric teaching of Dharmasar, which is based on the four states of consciousness. You know, you've seen the diagram a million times, right? But do you understand it? If you understand this knowledge, then you have the intellectual epistemological tools, the ontological framework to understand everything else. Because consciousness is fundamental. It's more fundamental than science, more fundamental than religion, more fundamental than any kind of technology, even meditation. Consciousness is Brahman. And once you realize that, everything falls into place. So we're going to continue now with Shankara's commentary. And what he does is very interesting because just as he began the exposition of the sutra from the opponent's point of view. He continues now to present the opponent's arguments and then counteract them. Opponent. Is not this very inference presented here by the aphorism, starting with that from which, etc.? What inference is he talking about? <laughs> well, on the previous page, there is the sentence, apart from God, possessed of the qualifications already mentioned, the universe, as described, cannot possibly be thought of as having its origin, etc., from any other factor. In other words, by process of elimination, everything else that is known cannot be the cause of the universe. So only God, only Brahman is left. This is an inference. It is not a declaration, as in the present sutra, which states, that is Brahman, from which are derived the birth, etc., of this universe. That's a different thing. And now Shankara is going to go ahead and explain this. Vedantin. No, for the aphorisms are meant for stringing together the flowers of the sentences of the Upanishads, for it is precisely the sentences of the Upanishads that are referred to and discussed in these aphorisms. So now he gives, you know, he drops it so casually, but he explains the purpose of the entire Brahma Sutra in one sentence. It is precisely the sentences of the Upanishads that are referred to and discussed in these aphorisms. Now, this is the mature conclusion of many, many scholars, and it became the basis of all further commentaries on the Brahma Sutras. Sankaracharya's was the first. So he opened the subject, he opened the topic, and then many others made differing commentaries on it, but they are all basically an attempt to refute Shankaracharya's, which has never been refuted. It can't be refuted because, precisely because, it shows the link 
between the sutras and the Upanishads on which they are based. The realization of Brahman results from the firm conviction arising from the deliberation on the Vedic texts and their meanings, but not from other means of knowledge like inference, etc. The logicians love inference because through improper inference, you can basically prove anything. You can prove that black is white, and we did this in a previous video, <laughs> through bad logic, through bad inference. Correct inference is that whose conclusion agrees with the Vedic statements. So he says the realization of Brahman refers from the firm conviction, and the footnote says, ascertainment of the true meaning and the possibility of the thing to be known. I mean, if it's not really possible to know it, then what use is inference? Because inference is knowledge based on words. Then he says, the realization of Brahman arises from the deliberation on the Vedic texts and their meanings. And the footnote goes on, when properly considered, the Upanishadic texts are seen to point to Brahman. So the logicians and commentators that try to disprove this, like the dualists and the logicians and the Buddhists and so on, and so many of them, always fail because the statements of the Upanishads, of the Vedic literature in general, are unassailable. And we'll get to that, a complete explanation, a deep, deep explanation of that in the next Adhikarana. When, however, there are Upanishadic texts speaking of the origin, etc., of the world, then even inference, not running counter to the Upanishadic texts, is not ruled out insofar as it is adopted as a valid means of knowledge reinforcing these texts. For the Upanishads themselves accept reasoning as a help. For instance, there is the text, The self is to be heard of, to be reflected on. Brihadaranaka Upanishad 245. And the text, A man, well informed and intelligent, can reach the country of the Gandharas. Similarly, in this world, a man who has a teacher attains knowledge. Chandogya Upanishad 6, 14, 2, shows that the Vedic texts rely on the intelligence of man. So there's a story behind the Chandogya Upanishad text, which you should know. A man is born in the country of the Gandharas, or wherever that is. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's one of those apocryphal tales. And He's kidnapped and blindfolded and taken far away and dumped by the side of the road. <laughs> he has no idea where he's at. He has no idea what to do to get back home. However, he meets a kind stranger who unbinds him, takes off the blindfold, and instructs him, you go this way and then you inquire from this person how to proceed, and you can return to your country. So this is the tale of the man from the country of the Gandharas, <laughs> referred to in this quote. Similarly, a man with a teacher, one who associates with a realized being, can return to his home, which is Brahman. So as far as the deliberation on Brahman is concerned, and remember, deliberation on Brahman is the first sutra, atato brahma jignasa, that therefore now one should meditate, one should concentrate, one should deliberate on Brahman. So as far as the deliberation on Brahman is concerned, the direct texts 
indicatory marks, etc., are not the sole means of the valid knowledge of Brahman, as they are when religious duties are deliberated on. So there are two divisions of the Vedic texts. One, the original four Vedas, and the Brahmanas based on them, give instructions on how to perform the Vedic rituals. So these are strictly indicatory. They are, do this, say this mantra, these materials are necessary, this is the correct time, and so forth. But the Upanishads aren't like that. The Upanishads are revelatory. They reveal truths that are inaccessible to direct perception. But in the former case, the Vedic texts, personal experience, etc., are the valid means as far as possible. For the knowledge of Brahman culminates in experience, and it relates to an existing entity. What does that mean, personal experience? The meaning of a particular passage has to be determined with the help of direct assertion, indicatory mark, syntactical connection, context, position, and designation. The above six means, as also reasoning, etc., determine the meanings of Vedic passages about Brahman. And through the individual competence of each test, they give rise to a particular mental state that is of the nature of the knowledge of Brahman. That state, again, destroys ignorance and culminates in the revelation of Brahman. So, this revelation, this realization, is a mental construct, a mental transformation, a mutation of the original state of the mind, which is identical with Brahman, in the form of, I am Brahman. Aham pramasmi. This is the very first and original realization that leads to all the rest. Since in the case of rites, etc., that have to be undertaken, there is no dependence on direct experience, the right, etc., being still in the womb of futurity, the direct texts, etc., alone are authoritative here. Besides, an act to be performed becomes what it is through human effort. Worldly or Vedic activities may or may not be undertaken, or they may be dealt with otherwise, as, for instance, a man can walk, ride, proceed otherwise, or need not move at all. Similarly, there are the passages in the sacrifice with soma juice called atiratra, the vessel containing the soma juice called shodashi is taken up, and in the atiratra sacrifice, the shodashi is not taken up. Taijasa Sanghita 6624. In the Agnihotra sacrifice, the oblation is offered before sunrise, and the oblation is offered after sunrise. These injunctions and prohibitions are meaningful here in a context of rites, as also are the alternatives, general rules, and exceptions. But a thing cannot be judged diversely to be of such a kind and not to be of such a kind, to be existent and non-existent simultaneously. Options depend on human notions, whereas the valid knowledge of the true nature of a thing is not dependent on human notions. On what does it depend, then? It is dependent on the thing itself. And this is the difference between knowledge of religious duties, which is relative and can be done or not done, invoked or prohibited, understood or not understood, or accomplished in some other way, if one is skillful enough. But the knowledge of the nature of a thing is inherent in the thing itself. And so the nature of Brahman is revealed 
not by words, not by thinking, not by reason, not even by inference, but by experience. One must know, I am Brahman. And that is developed by complete conviction alone. In other words, you have to believe it. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.